Oh, here we are. go. Hi, Mark. I'm so sorry for the for the for the technical glitch. I was like, I don't see you, and I know you said you can hear me, and our team was like, okay, Mark is on on the on the on live stream. <laughs> These things happen beyond our control. Yes, but I'm glad this worked. Uh, super, super excited. So thank you so much to coming on to our IG live. Um, but before uh, I give a little bit of introduction, but could you start by telling us about, you know, your background and how did you end up becoming a fertility expert? Yeah, you, you know, some of it was a little bit by accident. I um, very early on and um, as I was doing that, the first couple that I actually worked with was my and my dog is not not behaving at the moment but um the one of the first couples i ever helped uh support was uh going through pcos and um when i helped her in about five months or so i was able to um help her and she she came in with her positive pregnancy test and so forth and uh, that really changed the trajectory of of my of my life and my career. As much as I was able to help her um, on her path, I actually helped her with two kids. Um, uh, I don't think she realizes how impactful she was, uh, not only to my life but to the lives of so many other couples going through fertility, because it really pushed me in this direction. That's amazing. So is it is this a reason you called yourself the fertility detective? What does that mean? <laughs> well, she was not the reason why I I coined myself the fertility detective um, because she came in and she already had like we knew she had PCOS. So in in that case, it really wasn't a lot of detective work. It was a lot of um, refinement in her situation about putting her on the right plan. But for so many uh, women and couples reaching out, they have unexplained or they've been told there's no cause. Um, or, um, and, and so it's for really for those couples that the detective piece, that investigation piece really comes to play. Because when we don't know why, naturally we want answers and um, and we all deserve answers. And And I actually do not believe in unexplained uh, fertility issues. I believe there's truly a cause and a reason for all of these issues because as humans, we were meant to reproduce and, and uh, procreate. And if that's not happening, well, why, there has to be a reason and an explanation. And so for me, for all of those individuals, I want to dig deeper. I want to look for more answers and I want to help them understand why so that we can hopefully create a plan and a path to achieve the results that they deserve. I love this because I think in Western medicine, if you just go to a hospital, oftentimes a doctor might not even have the time to help you dig deeper and they just give you kind of like almost like a death sentence to be, you know, kind of depressing to say. But um, I think this personalized approach and digging deeper can really help people. Yeah, you know, I have, um, I often get asked the question like, do I believe in IVF or IUI? And I 100% do not have an issue with it. There's a, a time and a place for those procedures. My issue with those procedures is not their, what they can do. My issue is that often we're pushed in those directions to those procedures without real answers, right? Like as if that is the answer to the problem. And it's often not the answer to the problem. I actually, a perfect example was yesterday, I was talking to a woman who's had eight pregnancies, three children, five miscarriages. And in those five miscarriages, uh, recently she, I don't know if she was pushed to or she made an appointment with one of the IVF doctors. And, um, you know, I, I said to her, I'm like, if you want to go that direction, I'll support you 100%. But IVF is not a solution mm -hmm. until we understand why you're having the five losses. Mm -hmm. And until we can do that, the likelihood of you ending up with another miscarriage is really high. So, yeah. you know, IVF has its strengths and has its place, but it's it's not necessarily intended to be a huge uh, game changer in her situation right. because we don't understand what the underlying causes are for her. 
Right. So, you know, I think in those situations, we all have to understand the right path. And we think like we hear in the news, oh, IVF, it's so successful and so forth. And so we have these misunderstandings about what it can do. Um, and I often uh, see, unfortunately, a lot of women who come after IVF who have said, I still don't know why, and it was not successful. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I know everybody have their, you know, unique struggles. And then sometimes these situations can get pretty overwhelming. So how do you help couples to maintain hope? <laughs> so that's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think the first thing is that um, hope has to come it from two places, I believe. One is from ourselves, right? Like we have to have belief in ourselves that, um, an outcome can be different, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one aspect of hope. But I think the the hope that I specifically give uh, couples is that I'm going to look for answers, and that I'm also going to support them a hundred percent. And you know, we we all need someone on, on our side and in our corner mm -hmm. uh, when we're going to do something, right? And so if we don't have the proper support behind us it's hard to maintain that ability to keep going. It's hard to kind of muster that hope that, you know, maybe this coming cycle will be a little bit different. Right. right? So um, I think just knowing that I'm on their side and really looking out for their best interest uh, is one aspect of it, but also really that I'm there to really find answers. I'm not attached to one specific thing. My outcome is not always going to be one answer for mm -hmm. everybody. It's what's the best answer for you and we need to find that out. I love it. I, it makes me feel so satisfied, you know, hearing the, this answer. I love it. Um, so many of your clients are couples, you know, how, so how do you work with a, a woman versus like a man? Well, in, in, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're very different. Right. Um, and so, but in the end, the foundational pieces are still the same. And so a lot of the structure and outline is still fundamentally going to be the same, regardless if we're male or female. Mm -hmm. um, but but clearly there, there are differences. There's only so much testing I can do with a man. <laughs> At some point that, that ends, right? Um, so I think the first thing that everyone should recognize is some of those foundational things are no different for men or for women, right? Mm -hmm lifestyle, yes. diet, exercise, are you taking the right nutrients and supplements and so forth? So these foundational pieces, all, stress management, uh, sleep, these are all foundational things that we all need to address. Mm -hmm. Now, I might address something differently for for the, the female versus the male in the relationship, um, but that is all going coming back to what are the findings? What do we see? in our investigation and our testing, right? So all of that is going to be based on those key principles and investigations, right? I like to test and not guess. Yeah. And so some of it might be different. You know, if I find something in one individual versus another, and those recommendations in terms of diet and exercise are going to be different, then obviously we're going to go down that path. Um, but inherently, certain things are naturally different. Women need a different set of calories um, mm -hmm. and uh, nutrients than men. Uh, men can exercise more without a lot of um, uh, negative side effects on their hormones and fertility mm -hmm. versus women. And so, you know, those things are going to be different. But I think the biggest thing that I would say is that I'm going to look at the man, which so often gets ignored. Um, so if there is a difference, it's that we're going to actually investigate and look deeper into the issue. I have a, a couple that I'm working with in, I want to say they're in Orlando or Central Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, she took the, the brunt of the responsibility on her shoulders for much of what was going on. And I did... Um, when I did my evaluation, I said, okay, well, these are the things for sure that we need to address for you. But we need to have your husband right. tested. Um, right. Without that information, we don't know how to move forward. So he did a semen analysis, and it came back that they could not find any sperm. 
And so I had to retest it because when that happens, mm -hmm. I want to confirm that that's yes. the case. And I had to do it with a different lab this time to confirm. And sure enough, it was the case. I mean, they were able to find, you know, very, very little, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a big finding in a situation like this because one, that's really going to dictate and influence right. how you move forward with your care. And they've been spinning their wheels thinking, one, it's her, and why yeah. hasn't it been happening, right? Yeah. Like, they're talking about what sexual position should we be in to see if we can make this work more effectively, and that's really not even a conversation at this point, right? right? Because we need to figure out what are we going to do to solve this problem now. Right. And that is, I, I can't tell you how often, unfortunately, I see those sorts of things. And that's because either men don't want to be tested or they're ignored because they're like, oh, it's yeah. typically the female. Let's just look. And that's that answer is not accurate. It's not always the, the woman. Uh, right. the, the, the percentage of fertility issues that fall on the male side of things is almost equally distributed between women and men. Right. You actually answered my next two questions already, because we have also seen <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, um, ladies that we work with, they all think like kind of like fertility is their responsibility, but obviously there's whole men's component. And then obviously you also an answered that, you know, male fertility actually plays a role as just as equal parts as the, as female. Um, so what are some causes of uh, for infertility in males? So when we're looking at uh, men, we want to look at the three main parameters um, that we look at in a semen analysis. Now, we do look at other parameters in a semen analysis, but these are the big ones that often mm -hmm. gets discussed. So I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to analyze a full semen analysis, but talk about the big things. And so the first one is going to be count how many sperm do we have, right? The second one is motility. How well do they swim in a forward progression? Strong. And then three is morphology. How do they look? Do they have one head, one body, one tail, or are they all normally shaped, right? And so those last two parameters, motility and morphology, are percentages off of the first, off of count. Mm -hmm. So count is really, really important. It, it's, but I also don't say that to minimize the other two. Um, but if you have... 10 million sperm or you have 100 million sperm but the percentages of each one of the other two parameters don't change you inherently have way more to work with right mm -hmm. so this is why count is so important now with that over the years over over the generations actually and this comes into play with a lot of the work that you do at million marker is that over the generations um the the parameters of these three markers have dramatically decreased in terms of what's considered normal. Mm -hmm. So we used to consider many, many moons ago, a hundred million sperm count to be normal or more, right? Over the years, that number has considerably gone down. And I started at that number because I wanted people to understand what it used to be, because what's considered normal today versus what it used to be is now 15 million or more. That's a huge decrease, right? That's like now, 85%. Right. <clears throat> so it doesn't make sense. When you hear those numbers, we start to say to ourselves, well, why that's a huge decrease? Well, first, when the average across uh, all men has dropped to that number, that's why they've reduced that number to 15 million versus 100 million. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, why has that number decreased in men so dramatically over the generations? And that really comes down to the amount of chemicals and toxins that we all are exposed to on a regular basis. And the, the research has really, in the last several years, has really come out uh, in that direction profoundly. And that's where these toxins, these parabens and phthalates and so forth, have dramatically impacted the quality and quantity of the sperm that men are producing. It also does the same for women, but right now we're talking about men. Um, <laughs> and so, you, you know, that is a huge issue. So when you often hear me talk about 
cleaning up your life and cleaning up your diet and cleaning up your your house and your environment and the the uh, uh, skincare products, personal products you're using and so forth. This is exactly why. Because we're not going to get rid of all our chemical exposure, but our goal is to reduce as much as we can in the places we have direct impact and control over. So if you can do that, then you're making a step in the right direction. It's not about perfection, it's about progress. And so our goal with all of these men is to, is to look at all of those things and clean up as much as we can. That allows us to get to take this 15 million number and get us close to that 100 million. Because as we said, all those two other parameters, again, not that I'm not trying to improve motility and morphology, I am, but those two are percentages. So if I can change 15 million to 20 million or 30 or 50 million, I've increased the amount of sperm that we have to work with. And that's a huge positive in the right direction. The other reason I believe that that number has been chosen as a normal number is because now we also have insemination, IUI, and IVF. And I do think that that, what I haven't spoken to anyone who's told me this specifically, it's just my belief that I believe that that was taken into account when they were creating their normal parameters because we only need so much to do an insemination and hopefully mm -hmm. be successful. And so I, you know, obviously for natural conception, we want that count to be as high as we can get it. Yeah. And natural conception obviously is better, both from physical and economical perspective. So it's, it's really important because everybody understands how expensive um, IVF can be. Yeah. 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 Um, absolutely. You know, like, I, I mean, obviously my preference, it's going to be that everybody gets pregnant as naturally as possible. Uh, right. That's not always possible. And, you know, in the situation of like the, the couple I just mentioned from central mm -hmm. Florida, where literally if I, if I showed you the report, it said 14 sperm that were found. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah. And so when we're looking in situations like that, then we have to start to think in different ways. That is where IVF would be impactful and helpful. Because if we can use, even if half of those are normal and healthy and all you need is seven eggs, then we have something to work with to achieve our, our result. Right. We're, we're totally aligned on seven points um, because our goal is, you know, by providing a test so people can become aware of, you know, what product they're using in their daily life is actually impacting their health and then create like higher body burden. So this is totally cool. And we, you know, we provide recommendations, you know, what you need to change in terms of your lifestyle, eating out less, what, what product you need to swap out. But I also know like, you know, unhealthy lifestyle does impact, you know, sperm quality. So especially when it comes to food. So what are, you know, some male, you know, consume, consume like, you know, fast food and all these things to create this unhealthy habit. Can this, how much can this actually influence their, you know, sperm quality? I mean, uh, I don't know how to quantify that other than saying it's a dramatic impact on their sperm quality. What we eat is the number one influencer to our overall health, period. If you did nothing else but improve and clean up your diet, you would be making huge strides to improve your health and your sperm. I, I can't stress it enough. But again, this is not about taking away everything you love. It's not about being perfect. I don't expect anyone to be perfect. I'm not perfect. But I expect us to try to strive to live in that space about 80 to 90% of the time that you're then giving yourself the flexibility to stray from that on occasion. This Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. Three o'clock on Sunday, I'm gonna sit down and turn on my favorite sport to watch it and see who's crowned as champion. I'm also gonna sit down and probably pour myself a drink and eat some things that I would not normally eat because it's a time for me to relax, let go and not worry about it. But that's not going to be the way I eat every day for every meal. Right. 
And therein lies the difference, right? That should be the exception, not the norm for all of us. And it's about finding that ability, knowing the line we need to walk, and then recognizing it being okay when you're going to step outside of that line for yourself. Right. And there might be some things for each one of us that we shouldn't be stepping outside the line for. Like, right. I know certain foods that I just should not consume. And so even though I might give myself some flexibility, I'm still going to stay within certain boundaries for myself personally, right? right? And that's the same for all of us. And so for sure, we need to be consuming better food. Now, if you need for men, if you're working, you're on the go a lot, you need fast food, you need to consume food, you know, you need calories and energy, but you don't have time to cook every meal and you need something a bit faster, you're out and about. It doesn't mean that you can't eat out. It's about making better choices when you do that. We all have choices when we're out choosing meals. You just need to make a better choice and have some self-discipline to make right. those better choices, right? right? If McDonald's is on this side of the street, what's on the other side of the street that might be better? And even if, I haven't stepped foot in McDonald's in ages, but even if you had to, so I do not know what's on their menu, but even if you had to step in to McDonald's for whatever reason, let's say that you're on a road trip and there's nothing else to eat but McDonald's, what could you choose there that is a better choice than what right. you would have chosen, right? right? So there's always ways to make better choices, even when you have a difficult choice to make. So some males consume food that's high in uh, nitric oxide. Is that actually effective? Uh, it could be, it can be effective. So <laughs> I don't think I've ever been asked this question. Um, so nitric oxide um, is a nutrient that for some of you watching um, is part of uh, a um, supplement called L-arginine or an amino acid, okay? This helps to increase circulation. So it can be be it can be beneficial for improving circulation to the extremities and what part of a man is an extremity that we don't think about? Their penis, right? So if we need better erections, we can increase circulation there. It also will increase circulation to the testes. So hopefully bringing more nutrients um, for better quality sperm. So yes, that can be beneficial. So, um, beets are a big one. Okay. So other than, you know, taking a supplement, are there any food that's like you would recommend that's naturally high in nitric oxide? I just said it. Okay. <laughs> beets. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Beets. Interesting. Yeah. I missed it. Um, cool. So then are there any differences for uh, how men should approach their sperm health, you know, in term, uh, uh, when it comes to natural conception versus IVF or other forms of like fertility treatment. Can you say that question again? Oh yeah. So are there any differences of how a man should approach their sperm health in terms of like um, in natural conception versus IVF or other form of a fertility treatment? So do they need to do anything different to increase different. their fertility? Whether they're going through IVF or yeah, naturally? Or natural. Yes. I, I personally don't think so, other than um, maybe frequency of ejaculation and timing and so forth. Um, you know, even though men um, produce, reproduce sperm and create sperm every 24 hours, it doesn't mean we have an infinite supply. Okay. Um, and if you are, if your sperm is already compromised, then for me, one of the things that I like to recommend is that we want to kind of hold on to some of that a little bit more. So where we have conversations about timing and frequency of intercourse, some couples would say we have to have intercourse every day or, or even multiple times a day during their fertile window. I would argue that you actually need to do the opposite if we're having, if our sperm is compromised. I would say we're trying to maximize the quality and quantity. And so every other day would be ideal in a situation like this. And we mm -hmm. also forget how long good quality sperm can stay alive for anywhere from three to five days. So 
you shouldn't need to have intercourse mm -hmm. every day or multiple times a day during ovulation to achieve that result of conception. You should be able to time it appropriately. Now, some men, what we might find, especially when we're in the IUI or IVF world and we're doing some additional um, samples and testing, we might want to test, you know, on different days of abstaining, mm -hmm. it, where is there a rise or where's the best amount of sperm during that window? So let's just say for some men, um, we would say just abstain for one day. And for other men, we might even say abstain for as long as five, you know, maybe even a little bit longer, maybe six days. But usually we don't say beyond five, but sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. But even though we think that window is fine, maybe for me, it might be better at three or four days versus waiting longer or shorter. And somebody else, it might be, which has happened, it's every day they're better off. They're producing better quality sperm and having better results on a daily basis versus every other day. So that's also a piece of what we can determine and, and try to figure out. But usually we do that when we're going through an IUI or IVF. Makes sense. So you can tell we're like a big fan of lab testing because we do provide a test. Um, so when you test for uh, your patients, clients, you know, what tests would you recommend for couples who um, are concerned about sperm health, sperm quality? Well, first, we need to do a semen analysis. If, if a man hasn't done a semen analysis, 100% that needs to be done. And it will test more than just count motility and morphology. It, you know, we're looking at pH and volume and so forth. So that has to be done above everything else uh, for men. And I often get the question, well, if we're going to do that for men, do we also run hormones? I don't usually go down the hormone testing path until I have a semen analysis. If the semen analysis looks all fine, um, then there's probably no reason to do a hormone panel. But if there are some abnormalities there, then yes, we might want to also simultaneously do a hormone panel. The other test, which is really um, a scan, is if we find that there are parameters that aren't, um, that parameters are off in a semen analysis, then typically I would then also recommend that um, we do an ultrasound on the testes to rule out what's called a varicocele, which is a varicose vein in the testes. If you're familiar with what varicose veins are, usually elder, your, your grandparents have them, um, they usually find them in their legs and the, the veins are swollen and red and mm -hmm. odd and inflamed um, and painful often. This can happen in the testes <clears throat> and if it does, you can imagine testicles don't like to be hot. Sperm doesn't, doesn't like to be hot. And so if they're twisted, hot, and inflamed, it can impact the quality of the sperm that you're producing. So that absolutely needs to be ruled out. It is very common to find, unfortunately, um, in varying degrees, but there's a lot that can be done for it. Makes sense. Uh, so in the beginning, when I introduced you, I also mentioned about your YouTube channel. It's one of the most popular ones for fertility, Ooh. the Fertility TV. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, it's my little baby. Uh, I love it. Uh, it didn't start off as what it is today. I mean, I really uh, um, created it to just educate the couples I was working with and make it easier for them to reference some of the things that I was speaking about. Um, but it's really... Uh, turned in to educate women and couples from all over the world on different aspects of fertility. Um, a lot of the, the information we're talking about right now, I probably put out a video on it. Um, so you can go to my YouTube channel, Fertility TV, and search for the different uh, topics that you might be interested in, and odds are in your favor that there's probably a video on it. Um, I do put out or try to put out usually a video every week. Um, to support everyone watching. And I always say, if you haven't checked it out, do so, subscribe. Um, and every time you subscribe or like one of my videos, you're actually helping couples all over the world to get pregnant because it allows my videos to be seen more and allows them to be educated and get the information that they need. We're, we're definitely a follower. Um, <laughs> I know you have many clinics in San Diego. Could you also tell the viewers, you know, how could they book an appointment with you? Yeah, so if you're anywhere in the world, we always get this question is, you know, how can I support you if you are, let's just say, in Florida or 
Israel or the Philippines. Uh, we work truly with couples from all over the world uh, to support them on their journey. Um, and I have one primary program that I do that through. It's called my Hope Fertility Program. Um, and it allows couples to work with me one-on-one -on -one and in a group setting. Um, and they get a customized uh, fertility plan for their needs based on their labs, their results, and what they're looking for, right? Like what path they're going down as well. Um, and so if you want more information on that, you can always direct message me for that um, as well. Or you can just go to my website, marksklar.com. Awesome. I know we're a little bit over and we have a few questions. I'm not sure if you have time. If not, then maybe people can direct it to, to you. So um, I have a, I have a couple of minutes. Okay. So I'm going to scroll to, wow. We have like so many people join. I'm trying to scroll to the first question. Good um, luck. Cause when I do that, I can't find it. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody asked, is there still hope for a 44 year old? I believe so. I've had many 44 year olds get pregnant, um, but I don't think hope is going to be enough on its own. Right. So yes, there is hope, but we also need to understand what the cause is, why it's happening, and then have a plan for what we're going to do to address it. Um, somebody else asked, how do you test this? I think this question is referring to uh, the sperm counts for quality over different days and how they need to um, do how they need to. Oh schedule intercourse and whatnot. Yeah, so that would be a semen analysis every time because you want to see what's being produced at each one of those time frames. So you would be doing multiple semen analysis during that window of time. But what you would basically do is say, okay, um, one day of abstinence to a semen analysis, two days of abstinence to a semen analysis, three days of abstinence to a semen analysis. They don't know how it'll have to be done in the same week, for instance, but you want to know that separation to know so that way every time you do the test you see what the results are and you then you can gauge right uh somebody asked how can low sperm count be increased we can we kind of answer to this question during this video right um yeah sure. i mean i think those basics are are really really important but one of the things that that you can easily add in to improve sperm count is actually essential fatty acids like fish oils um it's been shown to improve uh sperm count Right. Um, so this question is a bit complicated. I'm hoping I'm going to pronounce this right. My man had a varicocele in his test. Varicocele yeah. in his test when he was 18 years old. Since he has a child, could he have a varicocele again? He could. I couldn't rule it out. And just because a varicocele um, is there doesn't mean he can't have children either. You want to address the heat and the blood kind of uh, stagnation that's going on in the testes to help clear that out. But it doesn't mean that the actual varicose seal is going to dissipate unless he does surgery for it. Yeah. Wonderful. I think that's all our questions. Thank you so much. This is like so informative. So like everyone, like be sure to follow Dr. Squire at the, uh, the underscore fertility underscore expert. Um, and then you can also you know, learn about Dr. Scores uh, service, uh, YouTube show, food supplement recommendations, and much more. So you can just click our LinkedIn uh, bio and tap the post promoting this um, this Instagram live. Yeah, can I mention one thing, Jenna, real yes, quick yes, before please. we go? Since you mentioned my Instagram handle, there is somebody out there impersonating me on Instagram and reaching out to women and couples, unfortunately, pretending to be me and asking and asking to be paid for consultations. Um, I am warning everybody, make sure it's me. You can always direct message me. I will respond with my voice if needed, okay? And you can see on my little stories on my, on my um, page on Instagram, the first one says warning. Check it out so you can see which one is the fake one and know which one to follow and who to trust. That's really good to know. So we have one last question. Sorry. It's like, sure, for go ahead. abnormal sperms, uh, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> it depends where the abnormality is. It's a general mm -hmm. question, right? So yeah. I would really need to look, um, look much closer at that, unfortunately. That makes sense. So yeah. 
thank you so much and thank you so much for extending the time and thank you everybody to join and i think several viewers said thank you so much to you um oh, my so pleasure thank you jenna i really appreciate being here and, and hopefully we can do this again yes let's do it thank all you all right okay bye. bye everyone have a great day have a good day bye bye